are spending um, these three chapters. And this is technically a new chapter what we're getting into here. But these last these these last three chapters have basically been an exercise in going back through everything that we've done um, and trying to understand how all those concepts that we already know uh, apply to objects that don't adhere to the particle model. So, right, so we're interested in the shape and the size of things. And so we need to be a little bit mindful of how we approach some of the old physics that we've had. And so what I'm going to do today is we are going to revisit a lot of the ideas of energy and momentum. And that's largely what, what today is. So, you know, knowing an object's um, size and shape uh, is going to allow you to determine things about energy and momentum. Now, I keep saying this, this phrase here. I said, well, we need to know the size and shape. And understandably, that language is a little bit vague, but based on the last couple lectures, I, I think you can now understand what I, what I really mean when I say that. When we look at a given object, there are basically a couple things that we want to know about that object if it has a size and a shape, and that is what is its center of mass and what is its moment of inertia. Because once you establish those two details, the other aspects of physics that we're going to talk about, like energy and momentum today, um, automatically have a process by which we, we look at those things. So, um, yeah, so center of mass and especially moment of inertia are very crucial for understanding what we're doing later here. Okay, so um, the first thing I want to discuss is for objects that can rotate. In particular, we want to have objects that can roll, okay? And if you think about it, things in terms of energy, if there is an object, for example, that slides across a gra the ground, right? Just slides across the ground, maybe it rolls across the ground, whatever. It just has translational motion. Previously, what we've said about it is that it has some kind of translational kinetic energy, one half mv squared. Um, an additional layer of complexity to this is to say, well, the energy that's imparted to it, that's meant for kinetic energy, can actually come in two different forms. It can come in the traditional one half mv squared, translational kinetic energy, but it also can come in the form of a rotation, okay? And so we did talk about in, well, I think it was two lectures ago, how we do that. The rotational kinetic energy of an object is um, one half I omega squared. So you gotta know moment of inertia, you gotta know its rotational period and so on. But there's a little bit more going on if you actually wanna look at an object that rolls, for example. And there is a very special condition as indicated in the figure here. If an object rolls without slipping, okay, and we're not really ever going to deal in, in physics 110 with an object that rolls and slips because it's a weird combination of static and kinetic friction that requires a sort of higher level understanding and, and we, don't, we don't get to that in, in physics 110. So when we talk about an object that rolls, it will always adhere, again, in physics 110, it always will adhere to a very simple rule. And the rule is this, that the angular velocity of spinning has to match the translational motion of the center of mass. Okay, And when you have that condition, the object does not slip, so to speak. Okay, And that's what you see in the figure here. Now, this equation that is stated right here, you sort of know this already, okay? This is a very fundamental equation that we introduced when we talked about circular motion, that you can relate the linear speed of a point on an object to its angular velocity if you simply know the radius. Well, the same thing is going to apply here, okay? 
that the velocity of the center of mass has to match how it spins. And so you have to have, know the radius of the object and its angular speed. And so uh, this condition is a very important condition for relating the two to each other, translational and rotational motion, right? All right, so what this reveals is something kind of interesting about individual points of an object that, that spins, okay? So, um, you know, in the figure here, what you see on the left is the simple translational motion of the object. Okay, the translational motion says that everything moves to the right with a given speed, the speed of the center of mass. I mean, so on average, the whole thing moves as a bulk, you know, mass to the right because of translational motion. But then when you mix in the rotation, the top of this disk is moving to the right while the bottom is moving to the left. And again, if you have the condition that the velocity of the center of mass is equal to radius times angular speed, we see that the center of mass has no relative motion. The bottom appears to move to the left and the top appears to move to the right. And so when you combine the two types of motion together, the translation and the rotation, we end up with how the object physically rolls. And so this description down here would be the view of, you know, a ground-based observer that's watching what's happening here, okay? So uh, the other views are basically in reference frames that match the kind of motion that we're interested in, whether it's translation or rotation. But basically, the bottom of the disk here has no relative motion to the ground. And that's why we've always spoken of motion that rolls. Uh, the interaction with the ground is a type of static friction because the object itself doesn't move relative to the ground. The center of mass will move to the right according to the relationship that I've already discussed. And the top, because it's further up here, will appear to move at least instantaneously faster. But it's because, it's because you are adding the translational and the rotational motion together that results in what appears to be a faster speed at that particular instant there. Okay. All right, so I got a question for you here. Again, don't worry about doing anything in the chat because I'm recording everything. I want to just worry about the lecture here. But just sort of consider this idea here. Uh, wheel rolls without slipping, which means you are trying to, you know, just to be clear, if we say a wheel ro rolls without slipping, that means the velocity of the center of mass is equal to r omega. So that's, that language implies that, right? So we want to know which is the correct velocity vector for point P on the wheel. Think about that for a minute. The answer here is going to be, oops, messed that up. It's going to be C, because what you are doing here is you're trying to consider I don't want my ugly mug in this video. Let me take that off. Okay. Um, we want to consider the combination of rotational and translational motion. So what is point P doing? Well, the entire mass as a whole is moving to the right, but P is also rotating. So we're going to combine the two types of motion together. There is a motion that's directly to the right. That's translational motion, which is what you see right here. And then there's the rotational aspects, which is in the middle. So translation is to the right. Rotation is directly up. The vector, some of these things, indicates that that particular point, from the perspective of a ground-based observer, is going to appear to move up and to the right. Okay? Up and to the right. Great.
All right. Ooh. So that means we want to characterize the kinetic energy of an object. We need to take into account both its translational and rotational energies, which is what you see in the equation here. Okay. Now, there's a couple of things about this that you want to be mindful of. Okay. The first thing that you want to be mindful of is the moment of inertia. So you gotta know what the shape of your object is to determine what kind of moment of inertia you're gonna use. You also need to be mindful of the center of mass velocity. And the center of mass velocity will allow you to connect the two together, the rotational and the kinetic side of things, okay? So I'm gonna do some examples here so you see how that's managed. Let's go ahead and get into the first example. This first example is actually pretty fantastic. see where my thing is here but let's look at this first example though all right so we have four different objects that we're going to roll down an incline and the idea is that um, you have a basic energy transformation right you have gravitational potential energy being converted into kinetic energy but because these objects have different moments of inertia, there is a certain percentage of energy that's going to be given to kinetic versus rotational. That's the key in this thing here. And so objects with a greater moment of inertia is going to require a much larger percentage of energy to maintain the motion that allows you to have the condition that the center of mass has to move with a particular rotational speed. So that relationship that I talked about, the V center of mass equals R omega, that condition must be met. And so that, based on a given moment of inertia, that automatically dictates how much energy goes where, okay? So let's look at how this problem is done. All right, okay, so like I said, the energy transformation is UG, to kinetic, that's true for all four objects, okay? That means the conservation of energy is gonna be MGY is gonna equal the kinetic energy, but that's broken up into rotation and translation. So the first term is rotation, the second term is translation. Um, as you can see here, we do need to know what the moment of inertia of these objects are. And I have listed them on the right here a particle has no moment of inertia because it has no size to it, right? The sphere is two-fifths mr squared, cylinder is one-half, and the hoop is mr squared. Again, these values are not something I figured out. They are given to you in the table in the lecture that I did that two lectures ago or something. I don't know. There was a, there was a, a lecture where I went over these values, okay? And so I just read them off from the table. So I'm going to manipulate the equation here, right? So I'm going to change my omega to match the condition of rolling. So omega becomes V center of mass over R squared. That was the relationship that we previously established. So that's taken care of. Um, I factor out the center of mass here and I solve for it, okay? So what this will tell me is this. This will tell me how fast something moves when it rolls down this incline that starts with a particular height. So if you really pay attention to this equation down here, what is different for the objects? What's different is simply the, the moment of inertia expression here. Okay, so since we are dividing a larger values of the moment of inertia, are going to result in smaller speeds. That's why the particle has the largest velocity. It's because all of its potential energy is converted to translational energy. So when it gets to the bottom of the incline, it goes the fastest. Then the next fastest is the sphere. Why? Because its coefficient is 0.4 as opposed to 0.5 for the cylinder 
or one for the hoop. So the sphere is the fast is the second fastest. Then the then we find that the hoop is the slowest. It has the largest moment of inertia. So that means you need to put more energy into its rotation and that takes away from its translational motion. And so by the time it gets to the bottom of the incline, it won't go as fast as the other objects. That's it. Okay. That's a nice little exercise in exploring the effects of rotation versus kinetic energy. Okay. And moments of inertia really dictate that split. Okay. So fantastic. Moving on, moving on, moving on to something else. What is that? Mm. All right. So here we have a more straightforward problem with numbers in it. And we want to determine, um, we have a salt sphere here. And we're going to allow it to roll down the incline. And we're basically doing the same problem we've been doing. We're going to put numbers behind it now. We want to know how fast it's moving at the bottom. And we want to know what fraction of the kinetic energy is in the form of rotation versus translation. So let's look at it. Okay. All right. So the same energy transformation will exist in this problem. We have gravitational energy being converted to kinetic. So that means our energy trans, uh, our energy, um, conservation equation will look like this. Uh, in this particular problem, I decided to change the velocity of the center of mass right here. Uh, I decided to turn that into the condition for not slipping. And so the velocity of center mass is R times omega. So that's what I've done here. Um, now, the moment of inertia for a solid sphere is given up here. Again, that's something that you would have to look up in a table. Uh, hollow spheres and solid spheres have different moments of inertia. The hollow sphere is, is much larger. The solid sphere is a bit lower. Um, and anyway, so you got to be aware of that. And as always, we give you diameters, but you don't want those. You want radii, so put that in there. Um, I didn't directly give you the height. I gave you the length of the ramp and its angle. So you'll need to figure out what that height is, but I've highlighted that right here. So now it's just a matter of simplifying the mathematics here. Um, this conservation of energy e equation translates to the thing on the right here. Um, I decided to get a common denominator. Now, notice something very interesting about this common denominator here. So this expression right here is what you sub is something you really want to pay attention to. So I still have separated these expressions into individual terms. The one on the left is the rotational aspect, and the one on the right is the translational aspect. And you can see there's two tenths here and five tenths here. And so that turns into basically seven parts. Okay, follow my logic here, ready? The two and the five add to give you seven. So there are seven parts of energy. And according to that equation there, two out of seven parts results in rotation, which is right here. Five out of seven result in translation, which is why I get the percentage that's right here. Okay, so that is one way that you can decide on how these things are split up, right? You're looking at their like coefficients and as long as the coefficients have equal denominators, then you have a pretty good idea of how things are split. Two parts out of seven are rotation, five parts out of seven are translation, all right? Uh, down here, I've continued the mathematics. I put in all my numbers here. I solve for omega, right? And I end up with 88 rads per second, all right? 88 rads per second. And that is the answer to part A. When they ask for angular velocity, you ought to put that in units of radians per second, unless they tell you uh, RPMs. And if they tell you RPMs, um, then you're going to have to multiply this by 60 over 2 pi. Now it puts it in RPMs. 
converts the radians per second into revolutions per minute, but that wasn't done here. And then the for part B, the fraction is based on me rewriting the expression here and uh, trying to work out you know what those what those parts are. And so uh, this is a great example. It's a very straightforward example for part A, and part B has a nice little conceptual um, focus on how you determine how much is rotation translation. So what I would say about this problem here is this sphere, if it was treated like um, a particle, would actually be moving much faster at the bottom. But according to the work we've done here, 30% of its potential energy was not put into the translational motion of the object. 30% was put into the rotational mo motion of the object. So as a result, to maintain the rotational motion of the object, you do need to take away, to some extent, um, energy that would be given to how fast it just moves. Translational motion. So that's that's a very good point. That's a very interesting part uh, of studying these things. So anyway. Oh, this is a busy slide. I gotta get rid of this stuff. Clear. All right, keep moving on. Get back to the PowerPoint. All right, so now uh, we wanna get into momentum stuff here. However, um, there's some details with vectors. that we have to sort of uh, develop because the way we do some things here with vectors are going to be, a little, it's going to make our life a little bit more easier. Now, I do understand that the stuff that I'm going to talk about here technically falls under the category of Calc 3. Okay, it's vector calculus. However, I, am, I realize that not all of you have had vector calculus. And I'm not going to assume any knowledge a vector calculus on your on your part. So I'm going to try to break this down into a more digestible um, exercise here so that you don't really need to know any math 250 or whatever the number is material. Okay. So um, the idea is that forces, velocities are technically vector quantities. And so if we look at the rotational equivalence of these things, which is angular velocity and torque, we would expect that they would be vectors too, which is true, except I haven't shown you that yet. And the reason why is because we haven't really developed the proper way to mathematically express how the rotational aspects are actually vectors, okay? And um, that's what I really want to do now. I want to kind of take a step back revisit the ideas of angular velocity and torque and introduce exactly how they are vector quantities. And that's going to help us understand how we deal with angular momentum. All right, so let's do that. All right, now, uh, the angular velocity is actually rather simple how we do this. Uh, we have something that we refer to as the right-handed rule. The right-handed rule allows us to put a directionality to angular velocity, okay? So in the example here, we have a disk that rotates, and as seen from an overhead perspective, the rotation of this object is counterclockwise, which, by the way, is the default direction for rotation in physics and in math, um, but the default orientation is counterclockwise, okay? Now... If you take your right hand, okay, your right hand, okay, and you curl your fingers in the same manner that the object rotates. So in this example here, I don't know if my screen is flipped or not, but I'm attempted to rotate my hands counterclockwise. Okay, that's how my fingers are rotating. When you do that and you extend your thumb, that is a perpendicular direction, and it indicates the direction that we typically assign to angular velocity, okay? So in this case here, 
that disk may be in the xy plane, but the vector for angular velocity is in the z axis. Okay, and again, there's this relationship between how you curl your fingers and how you extend your thumb. Okay, in this example here, curling your fingers in the same manner that which an object rotates, the thumb tells you the direction of the angular velocity vector. So if things were to rotate in a clockwise direction, you'd put your hand upside down and the vector would point downward. So that is how we handle the angular velocities as far as vectors are concerned. Okay. Now, the other aspect, which is a torque, involves something known as a cross product. So a cross product is, well, a cross product is a, is a Oh, there's a million ways to talk about cross products, but you, you know a little bit about dot products. That was another way to do multiplication with vectors. The dot product is a scalar multiplication where you just take their magnitudes and or take their components, really. Or the magnitudes, actually, there's two different ways to do it. And to put them together, the cross product in their hand is still a vector quantity. It's a different way to multiply vectors. And again, I don't want, really want to get into the concept too much of this because it, it's not really important for what we do. If you want to understand the concept of this stuff, this will come in later physics courses. This will come in your math courses later on. Um, at the moment right now, I just want you to understand how to do the, concept, the computational aspect of cross products and dot products. And we'll worry about the conceptual side of things later on, right? Okay, so uh, the cross product between two vectors is simply the product of their magnitudes times the sine of the angle between them, okay? And, but this is still a vector quantity. So it's very similar to the dot product. If you remember, the dot product was the product of their magnitudes times cosine alpha. And that was a, that was a scalar. So it's just the angle between the two vectors. This is very similar, except it involves a sine function instead. And it's a vector. And the vector is given by the right-handed rule, which the way it works is like this. You take your fingers and you align them along A. So if you look at the middle example right here, again, this is, this is terrible because we're in class. This is a lot clearer when you're staring at me on Zoom, this is not easy to communicate, but this middle example here, we have vector A that points to the right. So you can imagine doing this with your hand. Okay, You orient your hand to the right. This is my right, although it looks like left to you probably, but anyway. Maybe I'll do that. That looks to the right for you? I don't know. All right. What you do is you have your hand out like this, okay? And there's two ways you can orient your hand. You can make the palm face towards the screen or make it face away, okay? Now, I'm gonna go to my view because I don't know what your view looks like, honestly. I'm sorry, but I don't know. So my view is the vector goes that way. That's the direction that A goes, okay? And then B, according to the figure here, runs back into the screen. So if I have a choice between this or this, I'm going to choose this one. So my fingers are vector A. Vector B is directed toward my screen. And my thumb is the cross product. So it points up. Because it points up, that indicates to me how it will rotate. It will rotate like this which is counterclockwise in my perspective. Okay. So, two things about that. Cross products are the product of the two magnitudes times the sine of the angle between them. And there is a vector that's associated with this. It's given by the right-handed rule. And it basically matches uh, how the object will rotate. And I'll, I'll do a couple more examples here to so see how this works. Um, and by the way, if you look up right-handed rule stuff, be careful because there's a, 
a million different ways that people try to formulate the right-handed rule. And so if you have the time, which we all do because we're in quarantine, we're not doing anything right now, you can, you can research tens and tens of these things. And then hopefully after you look at all these different examples, you can kind of start to see, you know, the intention, right? What's the grand scheme of how cross products are supposed to work? So anyway. Okay. Well, this is kind of what I was describing here, actually. This is, these are various different ways you could describe a right-handed rule for... Um, you know, for your cross products here. I like to do my hand, okay? I like to do my hand and my palm and how I rotate things. Some people have these weird like gang signs with their fingers. I don't, that's what you see on the left here. I don't get that one, I don't like that. Um, I just, it's confusing to me. You know, if this is vector A and B, this ends up being your cross product, which would be like, I don't know, how the heck you do that? Like, this is A? Wait, A would have to go this way. Yeah, A. So in the last example, this is A, B, and C. But the problem with this is this hurts my hand. This hurts. So I'm not doing that one. Okay. The, the one that I did is the middle one. You extend your fingers in a particular direction and you curl them towards the other one. And your thumb tells you what's up. That's not a pun, but it is. Um, and then the screw gives you a very similar idea. This shows how the rotation turns into, you know, a, a cross park few things. Personally, personally, if you're asking me, you know, I like the middle one. This is the one that I'm that I'm I'm good with. Fingers out, figure out which way your palm goes. Okay. Curl your fingers, go up, go down. That's how you know, okay? I don't like the fingers, it hurts. I really don't, honestly, I don't even know what the hell's going on the right here. I should just take that out. But the one in the middle here, again, I'm not, it's like a sign language pun. Can you say that? Is that a thing? Do they have puns? I don't know. I don't know enough about sign language. All right, so let's, let's do one, let's do one. All right, got two vectors. We want to know what the cross product is. Now, excuse my notation here. I know you're, half of you are probably already writing an angry email saying, you, you don't have your notation right, Dr. McGovern. Well, okay, so I agree. This, this needs to have vector notation on it right here. It doesn't, I'm, I'm very sorry. All right, so. Here's how we do the cross product. Mathematically, numerically, it's the magnitude of the two vectors times the sine of the angle between them. And I'm giving you that right here. You have magnitude of one for D, magnitude of two for C, and uh, and the angle between them is uh, 110, right? It's 20 plus 90. So that's, that's numerically what the cross product is. That's done. Now we gotta get direction. So the way direction is gonna work here is, again, the way I would do this is you, you put your fingers, you orient them so they are pointed like C. So that would be something like, oh gosh, this is so hard to do. Oh my goodness. Like that, that's C, like that. This hurts too, actually. That's C. Now my palm is upward, because D points up. Okay, so into the page is my cross product vector. C's down here, palms up because D is up. Into the page is the direction of the E vector. Okay, so how does that translate to like torque, for example? Well, C would represent, say the, you know, say the, um, well, hold on here. Yeah, so, you know, C is going to represent your moment arm or your, say, your radial line. That's the R. Uh, D is the F. That's the force. And it's going to cause a rotation that is into the page, which is clockwise, as the way I see it, clockwise. 
okay? So that's gonna cause a clockwise rotation. This is very abstract. Let's get to examples where you, it's more clear what's going on here, though. Well, there you go. <laughs> so here's how we do it. Um, we can now that you understand a little bit more about cross product now you can we can take the rf sine theta that you're familiar with and we can turn that into a more mathematical description that is the cross product here okay so in the example that you see in the figure okay we have our r is the radial line f is the force and if you want to do cross product r goes up into the left F is down, okay? And so my thumb points out of the page and that's gonna cause the wheel to rotate counterclockwise. So for that example right there, I mean, I can tell. I mean, if you, without any, no, any cross product at all, you just look at this and say, okay, well, R is up and to the left and F is down. So yeah, my wheel is gonna rotate or let the nut on this thing or whatever you're we're trying to unscrew like a you know, the, the lug nuts from this tire here, you know, that's gonna result in a counterclockwise rotation. But you can do the vectors there. R is up like this, F is down like this, out of the page, out of the page means rotating like this, counterclockwise, okay? Of course, because you have a cross product here, you still have your sine function. So the other example, which is given right here, um, is showing that there's basically no moment arm here. Uh, oh, actually, this is showing the torque. Never mind. I thought it was another example. Never mind. This is the torque vector, right? And so this is how it's going to rotate. So you put your thumb out of the page and you curl your fingers. So you can do that right now. Take your thumb, point it towards you. The way you curl your fingers is the way this thing's going to rotate. Okay. Again, Trying to show you three-dimensional things on a Zoom lecture is not ideal, and I apologize, and I wish there was an easy way to do this. Um, usually we're in class, and we're all doing these weird hand gestures, and when you take your fourth exam, everybody's trying to do these weird right-hand rule stuff, and we all look ridiculous. And But you're just going to look ridiculous in your own home. So, Okay, now, if you remember about... Um, Dot products. There's two ways to do it. Dot products are the product of the magnitudes times cosine of the angle. Cross products have a similar thing. It's the product of the magnitudes times the sine of the angle between them. Dot products had a component form. You multiply the x components and you add it to the product of the y components. You get a scalar quantity. And that was your dot product. Okay, there is a similar component form of a cross product. However, this is still a vector, and I have simply given you what the formula is. Now, technically speaking, you would learn this in either linear algebra or vector calculus, but you have neither, or at least you don't need either. So I've simply stated for you what the formula is, okay, and it's the, what's listed down here, okay? So I'm going to go through... And I'm going to do these examples here, utilizing these different formulas and to see how they work. So let's jump right into that one. Which is right here. Okay. So here I have utilized my component notation. Now, let me tell you something here, though. If they're given a component, you ought to use the component form, which you see down here. If you're given magnitudes and direction, utilize the other form. Um, I don't have magnitude directions here. I can figure them out, but it won't be fun. It will not be fun to try to figure out what the angle between these two vectors are. It's not incredibly hard. But your first vector is the R vector. Okay, and that's the A in the formula down here. You have an AX, you have an AY, you have no AZ. The second vector, which we call B here, is the force vector. You have no X component of B, you have a Y component of B, 
and there is no z component. So in terms of the formula at the bottom here, a lot of terms just disappear because a lot of terms are zero. So I worked that out here for you, up here. Now, what I decided to do up here at least is decide to like actually utilize like kind of like a FOIL method in a way like a distributive property to sort of see you how the vector uh, subtract uh, the vector uh, multiplication is supposed to go here. So if you do eight times negative 11, <clears throat> you get I hat cross J hat. If you do eight I hat times negative 11 J hat, sorry, sorry, no, no, no. If you do five J hat times negative 11 uh, J hat, you get the second term here, which is negative 55 J hat cross J hat. Now J hat cross J hat is zero because they're parallel. And that means the angle between them is zero and sine is zero, sine of zero is zero. So that term's gone. And you just end up with the first term here, which is I hat cross J hat. Now I hat cross J hat, if you do a coordinate system, that's K hat. You also could see that from this little here, which I think I might've shown you when we were back on campus, but there's a little cyclic nature here. And the cyclic nature is I put an I hat J hat and a K hat in like a, uh, like a triangle, right? And when I do that, if you try to perform a cross product that moves in a counterclockwise way, that cross product ends up being positive. And if you try to do this in a way that goes in a clockwise direction, that would be negative. So what I mean by that is this, I cross J is positive K. However, if I were to do, say, I cross K, that would be negative J, because I'm going clockwise here. So that's one way you can visualize what's going on up here. Um, if these two vectors do represent a, 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 you know, a, 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 radial, um, a radial arm and a force here, then this is your torque right here. This is your torque. So this object, because it's negative, it's going to rotate clockwise with a torque of 88 newton meters. Now, at the bottom here is is more aligned with the definition at the bottom here. I have I have more complex components. So again, if this is torque, A could be R and B could be force. And so what I've done here, I just identified all the different AX, AY, AZ, BX, BY, BZ parts, and I just put together a formula and end up with this little expression down here. So that's how we utilize the cross product stuff. We don't do this too much, but you should see it. Um, and of course, if you're taking physics after this class, you'll see a lot more of it. So let me move on. Okay, so <clears throat> now that we have a cross product, I can now introduce to you the concept of angular momentum because you really cannot talk about angular momentum without a cross product. You really need it. Um, there's not a really proper way to talk about it without it. Now, the picture on the left here shows the linear momentum of our object. So we have some particle, mass m, moves to the right. Its momentum would be mass times velocity. But I can also describe the angular momentum of this particle with respect to a um, a location on the plane of motion. And so if I do that, I add an additional element to it. Instead of mv, I have rmv. And the r, when multiplied by the mv, turns this linear momentum into an angular momentum. Now, the r and the, M and the, uh, the moment inertia vector here, okay, that forms a cross product that allows us to know what the angular momentum is. The angular momentum is given by this capital letter L. It's defined by the cross product of R and P. And so that means the magnitude is R M V sine beta. Beta is the angle between the momentum vector and the position vector here. And that allows us to characterize an angular momentum for object. Now the object, by the way, doesn't need to be moving in a circle or anything. 
It's just the momentum times the distance that it is from some center that we are considering. If the object moves in a straight line, it has an angular momentum still. If the object moves in a circle, it may have a, a more constant angular momentum, but that's, that's how we define it. Okay. Now, the reason why we want to do this is because if you remember, <clears throat> we talked previously about this relationship down here. dp dt equals f net. That was the original Newton's formulation of, of his second law. And so as you might have noticed throughout these last couple lectures here is that we are developing rotational equivalence to things. And that means there ought to be a rotational equivalent of Newton's second law. And we got it, and it's this thing right here. DL dt is to the net torque. So this is basically equivalent <clears throat> to this expression that's down here. If you multiply both sides of the equation here by an r, that's how you get this thing right here. If you go from here to here, you're gonna multiply That's how you go from one to the other. That's why we have this definition, because you want it to match Newton's second law. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna do a couple examples here. What are we doing here? Oh, I got a lot more. Oops. I just killed my power point accidentally. Shoot, let me try that again, sorry. Mm, where is that? Well, I guess I'm gonna screen share the thing I'm working on. All right, next example is the following here. <clears throat> so we have um, a solar system. We got a, a planet in the middle here. We're not looking at the sun. We're looking at a planet. We're looking at a satellite that goes around. So the satellite um, can make sure the picture looks kind of clear here. This is what the picture ought to look like. You got this planet here. We have our satellite that moves in an elliptical orbit about the planet. And we're trying to determine what the neck torque is and the speed at different points. And this problem ends up being a conservation of angular momentum problem. Uh, the only force that acts on the satellite is um, gravity. And so gravity will be sure to maintain the angular acceleration of this object. Uh, sorry, the angular momentum, I should say. If it gets more distant, its speed will change accordingly. By the way, that's like a fundamental law of astronomy. It's Kepler's Second law. It's the statement of conservation of angular momentum. Take me for astronomy if you want to hear about that stuff. I talk about that quite a bit in my course. All right, let's bring up that example now. All right, so what is the net torque at point A? At point A, if you can't tell, is right here. That's point A. So in order to know what the torque is there, we have to do R, F, and the sine of the angle between it. Now, the um, R and the F vectors, okay, are, um, are parallel here. R points to the right, F points to the right. There is no net torque on this object. So the answer is zero, okay? The angle, the sine of the angle, the angle zero. Okay, so R and F are parallel, that's out. What is the satellite speed at point B and C? Okay, well, in this problem here, angular momentum is conserved. So that means the angular momentum that's stated at A, B, and C are all the same. That's true, okay. If there's no torque, 
you're not changing the speed at any point here. Okay, I'm sorry, you're not changing the angular momentum, I should say. Okay, so um, that creates a sort of a very different kind of problem. Put it that way. Okay. Now, for the angular momentums, now this mass is never going to change here. The mass is never going to be different. So what I have below it is the expressions for angular momentum at these different points. Now, at A and B, there's no angle to consider, okay, because there, everything's parallel. Uh, not parallel, perpendicular, the velocity, I should say, and the value for R is perpendicular. And then, of course, at C, we have a little bit of an angle there. But the idea is that conservation of angular momentum states these are all the same, okay? Now, you do have to work out this distance right here, the distance from the planet to point C. It's not clear, but you are given numbers in the problem that let you figure that out. So it's a matter of just solving these little proportions here. Um, at point A, we know that we're traveling sort of fast, okay? If we're farther away, we should be going slower. You would expect C to be a little bit slower, and it turns out to be about a half slower, okay? Um, and it turns out at point B, we're even slower than that because, again, the distance is much bigger. Uh, but in this example here, the key is conservation of angular momentum. And the reason why we can state that is because... If your net torque is zero, okay, if your net torque is zero, your momentum is not changing. And that is true for an object in orbit, for example. The net torque is not changing at all. Okay. So uh, that allows you to make those statements. Okay. Moving on once again. So there is a, another way to formulate the uh, moment, uh, sorry, the angular momentum. If you take sort of the uh, language uh, that we've earlier that we developed earlier, so we said torque is R F, but we know that um, torque is also equal to uh, I alpha. So if you kind of shuffle around things there, and let me show you how you would do that here. So you would say. Torque. Well, that's not how you spell torque. Torque. Is RF. Well, that's not an R. I'm having a hard time here. That's also equal to I alpha. I'm going to use A here. Okay. Well, you know, what is alpha? Alpha is, um, you know, omega divided by uh, time. Well, move the time over here to the other side. If you combine the time over here, you can change that F into a, a momentum, right? So the time goes up there. Because remember, momentum is dp dt. Well, the T comes up here. And so F times T, that's like the impulse, right? That's momentum. And then you sneak the R in there. So this is like R times impulse, which we said is J, right? And that's omega. We'd still need an I here, I suppose, right? That's I omega. And then um, you sneak the R in there, and that's angular momentum. So the RJ ends up being L. Again, I didn't make up these letters. And that's how you end up with this. So there's a, a way to sort of transform the torque equation to this. And this is a bit nicer just because it's there's no dot product here. I'm sorry, cross product. It's just kind of the angular momentum and the rotational velocity vector just kind of match up and it becomes just a scalar multiple. So that's sort of nice. Um, but yeah, that's what's going on here. So let's do an example where we utilize this definition. I think I have a question for you first, though. Oh, well, I'm not going to say much about this slide because I've kind of been going on and on about it, but there are the rotational and translational equivalents here. So soak that in. That's kind of beautiful right there. 
All right, so if we have an isolated system, okay, that means there's nothing external acting on the, uh, the objects here. Uh, they are experience, experience no net torque, and therefore the moment, uh, sorry, the angular momentum vector is a constant. And so that sets up a whole slew of problems like we had in, um, like we had in um, linear momentum. Okay, we're going to have similar problems in angular momentum now. So, um, one really fantastic example of angular momentum is the example of the skater. Now, the idea is that when the skater is starting to spin, they do this thing where they kind of extend their hands out and they start to undergo a spin and then they pull their hands in towards the center and as a result of that, they spin faster. And we could understand that very easily through conservation of angular momentum because angular momentum is R M V, right? At least that's one way to think about it. And so if they have their arms out like this, their effective R is larger. And as you pull them in, the R goes down. Well, if the R goes down and you're an isolated system, some other aspect has to compensate for the drop in the mathematical quantity. And obviously the person will gain mass, so the only way they can balance things is to spin faster. And so when you pull your arms in, they spin faster to maintain the angular momentum. That's the idea behind that example. All right, so think about this question for a minute here. Okay, this is kind of long, so if you're watching this as a video, pause the video, read over everything. If you're here in the lecture, just I'll give you time to look over it. All right, so two buckets are spinning around. It starts to rain. What does that mean? It means the effective mass of these buckets are increasing. Now, you might remember back when we did momentum, which wasn't too long ago, two weeks ago or so, we had a similar issue. You have a train car going, rain's dumped in, or gravel, or whatever's dumped in, and what does that do? Well, you're increasing the mass, right? So if you increase the mass and you're trying to conserve momentum, what has to happen? Things gotta slow down. So that's what we would expect to happen here. As mass is dropped in, sorry, as, well, rain is dropped in, the mass increases, right? And that's gonna result in um, a conservation of momentum that's gonna require things to move a little bit slower. So the answer here is going to be C. The buckets slow down because you're trying to conserve the angular momentum. The mass goes up, therefore, and you can't change the radius here, right? So if the mass goes up, something has to go down, that'd be the velocity or angular velocity or whatever, any velocity would have to go down. That's what we're looking at here. Okay. Now, the other example, I mean, it's good. sometimes it's good to look at the other options and see why they're wrong. A just makes no sense. There's no change of potential energy, period. Everything's horizontal here, so that's wrong. Buckets continue to rotate at a constant angular velocity because the rain's falling vertically. No, 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 no. Your mass is increasing. Does it matter that things are happening and why? Masses increase, so so that has to change the next. D's the same thing as B, basically. E is the second best option. It's wrong. <laughs> but it's the second best one, I think. Anyway. All right, so let's do a real simple conservation of angular momentum problem here. Uh, we have an isolated system. We have a disk that spins with a particular speed. And uh, we're going to drop a loop or hoop or however you want to call it on there. And obviously, um, since that hoop that was dropped uh, was not, it's, it's, it's not spinning when it drops. So that means we are effectively adding more mass to our system and we do expect there to be a slower rotation. The question's now gonna become how much slower. So that's what we're gonna look into, how much slower. All right, so you wanna create an initial and final 
angular velocity expression. Okay? The initial angular velocity is going to be the moment of inertia of the disk, which we know is one half m r squared. That's some of the tables that we talked about. And there's an initial angular velocity. Now here we actually can leave our uh, angular velocity in units of RPMs because we're dealing with just a bunch of ratios here. So you're allowed to keep things in non-standard units. It's when you start to mix in constants, when you start to put things in terms of SI units like newtons or, or joules, you have to make sure everything's converted. Everything's just a bunch of ratios here. Okay, what happens for the final angular momentum? Well, your hoop falls, and now you have two masses here. So the moment of inertia of the two masses is going to be the sum of them. So you have the disk's moment of inertia, and now you have this extra moment of inertia that's from the loop. Now, that moment of inertia is just mr squared. Again, look it up in the table. It's just mr squared. But they're going to move with a common final velocity now, final angular velocity. So we solve for that, and you end up with this beautiful ratio right here that shows that you're dealing with a proportion. The angle of velocity is going to fall as much as the uh, moment of inertia has increased. Makes sense. That makes a ton of sense. So we just put all our numbers in here. Okay. Again, one half mr squared for disks, mr squared for hoops. Plug in all your numbers, and we find that. We're dropping by a half. Why? Because apparently we increase our moment of inertia by a half. That's what happened. And that resulted in this drop in the angular speed by exactly a half. So this is a very good example of simple conservation of angular momentum. All right, so that's that's a good example there.